Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that everybody's doing great today, and I hope that you had a wonderful weekend. What we're looking at today is lesson 31.14, which is on page five of your current lesson handout. We're gonna be talking today about differential equations and what are referred to as initial conditions. So to begin with, what a differential equation is, is an equation that contains the derivative of a variable. So this is an example of a differential equation, dy dx equals 3x squared minus 4. It contains the derivative of the variable y. dy dx is the derivative of y with respect to x. When you are solving a differential equation, your goal is to solve for the variable whose derivative is in the equation. So for example, in this equation, we would want to solve for y. And if you want to change dy dx, which is a derivative of y, to y, you would have to anti-differentiate. The antiderivative of the derivative of y will give you y. So when you solve this differential equation, you're going to have to go through the process of anti-differentiating both sides of the equation. And when you do that, the solution you get, and we learned this in the last lesson, is going to be a general solution. So for example, Now in Math 30-1, at the beginning of the course in Math 30-1, you learned that when you add a number to a function, what that number is responsible for doing is translating that function vertically. So you can think of this constant, this capital C, as being exactly equal to the letter K that we used in Math 30-1. And we can think of it as being a missing parameter. If you wanted to know the exact value of c, then you would need to know the coordinates of a point that this function passes through. Because for example, if I knew that this function passed through negative one comma five, then I could put five in for y, negative one in for x, and that would allow me to solve for the constant which would correspond to a vertical shift that would cause this graph to pass through that point. So let me give you four specific examples that would all be considered solutions to this differential equation, dy dx equals 3x squared minus 4. One of the solutions would be y equals x cubed minus 4x. One of the solutions would be y equals x cubed minus 4x plus 5. A third solution would be y equals x cubed minus 4x minus 4. And a fourth solution might be y equals x cubed minus 4x minus 7.2. And it's pretty easy to see that these are all solutions because when you differentiate any of these functions with respect to x, you get dy dx equals 3x squared minus 4, which is the equation that we were asked to solve for in terms of y. And the thing I want you to notice is that all of these functions are identical except for a vertical displacement. This is what we call in mathematics a family of functions. The only difference between the first function that I wrote and the second one is that the second one has been translated five units up. The third function takes the first function and translates it four units down. And the final function takes the original function, y equals x cubed minus 4x, and it translates it 7.2 units down. So we know algebraically that these all give the same derivative, but now what I'm gonna do is explain to you why graphically they have to give you the same derivative due to the fact that they are all identical functions except for the fact that they are vertically translated. If I were to take a look at the first function, so this function is y equals x cubed minus 4x plus 0. That's what it looks like. 
The second function that I used in my illustration was y equals x cubed minus 4x plus 5. And we said that that was identical to y equals x cubed minus 4x, but it was shifted up 5. The third one was y equals x cubed minus 4x, and it was shifted down 4, so it had minus 4 attached to the end of it. And the last one was shifted 7.2 units down. So the brown function is y equals x cubed minus 4x minus 7.2. Now we have already seen why these all have the same derivative. And algebraically we explain that because the derivative of that constant is 0. So we're going to get the same derivative regardless of what the constant is. But let's explain graphically now why these must have the same derivative. Don't forget the derivative is an expression for the slope. So if I said to you, what is the slope of each of these functions at x equals, and I'm going to choose a number, of 1.4, then I'm asking you to find the slope of the tangent to these functions at those four points that I've labeled. Each of those blue points is at x equals 1.4. We already know that all of these functions have the same derivative. The derivative of every one of these functions is going to be 3x squared minus 4. And the reason why that's going to give you the same result is that all of these tangent lines are all going to be parallel to each other. So those four straight lines are the four tangent lines. And of course they're going to be parallel because the only difference between the graphs is the graphs have been shifted up or down relative to each other. Now, if I asked you which particular function would be a solution to the equation that passes through negative 1, 5, and there's a point that I've just added at negative 1, 5, your job would be to ask yourself, how much you have to shift that green function up or down in order to pass through that point. And you can see by looking at this that the solution would be 2, which means that if I were to graph y equals x cubed minus 4x plus 2, not only would it be a solution to that differential equation, but it would also pass through the point that the function is supposed to pass through. So now let's take a look at a few examples. For each of the following, solve for y. So we have dy dx equals 4x minus 2. And we won't worry right now about this added information about the initial condition. I'll come back to that in a second. If you're asked to solve dy dx equals 4x minus 2, then you're asked to rearrange this equation for y. And in order to go from dy dx to y, you have to anti-differentiate. So we have to anti-differentiate both sides of this equation. And the most general antiderivative of 4x minus 2 is 2x squared minus 2x. So there are an infinite number of solutions to this differential equation, but we are told that there is this initial condition that when x equals 2, y equals 5. What that is telling us is that the graph passes through 2 comma 5. y equals f of x passes through 2 comma 5. Or looking at a table, when x is 2, y is 5. And that's why I referred to this value of c earlier as being a missing parameter. If this were a Math 30 course and you were asked to determine the missing parameter that made this equation true, you would simply substitute in x equals 2 and y equals 5 and solve for c. And that means we're going to get 5 equals 2 multiplied by 2 squared minus 2 multiplied by 2 plus our constant. Simplifying this, we get 5 equals 8 minus 4 plus our constant. So 5 equals 4 plus our constant, which means if we subtract 4 from both sides, our constant is equal to 1. 
And that means the solution to this particular differential equation with this particular condition is that the function y equals 2x squared minus 2x plus 1. So not only will this solution make the differential equation true, because the derivative of our solution is 4x minus 2, this solution is also a function that passes through 2 comma 5. Because when you put 2 in for x, you're going to now get 5 for y. And that's the solution to the first question. Example 2, it uses different notation. It has y prime. But again, if you want to go from a derivative of a function to the function itself, it's going to require that you anti-differentiate. And if we anti-differentiate y prime to get y, we must anti-differentiate the other side. And what we're going to get is 2 ln x, because the derivative of 2 times ln x is 2 times 1 over x because the derivative of ln of x is 1 over x and that's 2 over x plus what is it we differentiate to get cosine the answer is sine of x and then we have minus sine x which means we have to add cosine of x because the derivative of cosine will give you negative sine now we're going to add our constant since we're given an initial condition that when x equals pi over 4, y is equal to 0, we can put 0 in for y, and pi over 4 in for x. And solve for our constant. We have 0 equals 2 multiplied by the natural logarithm of pi over 4. The natural logarithm of pi over 4 is not something we want to start evaluating in decimal form. It's going to be an irrational number. Let's just leave it as the natural logarithm of pi over 4. We can go to our unit circle, either on paper or in our mind, and see that the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And the cosine of pi over 4 is also root 2 over 2. And then we have plus our constant. Simplifying just a little bit further, we have 2 ln of pi over 4 plus root 2. Root 2 over 2 is half of root 2. So we have half of root 2 plus half of root 2. Well, half of anything plus half of the same thing is a whole amount of that thing. So when we have root 2 over 2 plus root 2 over 2, we end up with 1 root 2. Then, of course, we have plus our constant. And this is equal to 0, so it's pretty easy to see what we're going to get for the constant. We move all of the terms to the other side, and we get negative 2 ln pi over 4 minus root 2, which means our function, which was y equals 2 ln x, plus sine x, plus cos x, plus our constant. Since this is our constant, our function is y equals 2 ln x plus sine x plus cos x minus 2 ln of pi over 4 minus root 2. And that's the solution to the second problem. Now we're going to talk about initial conditions and how they relate to motion. And I'm going to remind you that we learned way back in chapter 2 that when you take position, and s of t is position, and you differentiate position, you get velocity. And when you differentiate velocity, you get acceleration. And that must mean that if you anti-differentiate acceleration, you will get velocity. And if you anti-differentiate velocity, you will get position. And I'm going to warn you right now that the kinematics formulas that you use in Physics 20 and Physics 30 
to solve problems involving position, velocity, and acceleration will not always work in this course. Those formulas that you've been taught in high school physics only work if the velocity is changing at a regular rate. In other words, they only work if the acceleration is constant. Now, a lot of the time it is, but I want you to solve these problems in calculus the way we're going to be doing today. Do not rely on formulas. One other thing I need to address is the fact that in physics 20, the initial position is always considered to be zero. So for example, as an example, if an object were thrown upwards from the top of a 23 meter tall building, what we would say in physics about this situation is the object had an initial position of zero and its final position is negative 23 meters. So we would say that the displacement is negative 23. Now, a big difference is that in math, we never worry about the word displacement. We only worry about the word position. And the initial position is whatever the initial position is in this course. So with the same illustration, if I throw an object upwards from the top of a 23 meter tall building, the position that the object has to begin with is 23 meters. The ground is always zero, always which quite frankly makes more sense than saying zero is at the top of a building. But that's what we do in physics 20. So in math, you need to remember that the ground level is always zero. Now, when you start to solve these problems, you're always going to start off by knowing what the acceleration of the object is, as we'll see in a second. If you anti-differentiate the acceleration to find out information about the velocity, you're going to have a constant because the antiderivative is always going to contain a constant. And if you anti-differentiate the velocity to find out something about the position, you're going to have another constant. You use the information given in terms of initial conditions to determine the values of those constants. So we're going to do one last example that will illustrate that. Somebody takes a small frozen Cornish game hen and they throw it upwards with a speed of four meters per second from the edge of an 85 meter cliff near the surface of the earth. And you're asked to find three things and we are going to be finding them using calculus, not using the formulas that are on your formula sheet in physics. The first thing you need to know is that the acceleration of any object under the influence of gravity near the surface of the earth is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. If you're a physics student, then you know that we use negative 9.81, but negative 9.8 is close enough for what we're concerned about here in this course. Now I would recommend as a start, when you have the acceleration, use that to find the velocity. Once we have the velocity, we can use that to find the position. So if acceleration is negative 9.8, velocity is negative 9.8 t plus a constant. I have anti-differentiated in going from here to here. The only problem is we would really like to know what that value of C is. Well, one of the things that you are told is that it is thrown upward with a speed of four meters per second. So what does that tell us? It tells us that when the time is zero, the speed or velocity is four. And we can use that ordered pair in our velocity equation to find the constant. We're going to have four is equal to negative 9.8 multiplied by zero plus C. Well, negative 9.8 multiplied by zero is zero, so we get four equals C. And that means that our velocity function is negative 9.8 T plus four. Well, now I can explain to you why we use the phrase initial condition. This four is the initial velocity. 
this bit of business here that we did, we didn't need to do that. This whole idea of thinking of finding C by substituting in an ordered pair that the graph passes through really is not needed here. All you need to do is remember that your constant in your velocity function will always be the initial velocity. And that's why we use the phrase initial condition. So we have our acceleration defined. We have our velocity defined. The only thing that's left, which would allow us to answer anything about the motion of this Cornish game hen as it tumbles towards the earth, is the position function. And that means that we have to, once again, anti-differentiate. So what is the antiderivative of negative 9.8t? Notice everything is with respect to t here, by the way. It would be negative 9.8t squared divided by 2. Plus, what is the antiderivative of 4? That would be 4t. Plus, we have an arbitrary constant. By the way, we tend to use the letter c for an arbitrary constant. But I hope that it's obvious with a little bit of thought that your constant c in your velocity function, which worked out to be 4, is not necessarily going to be the value that your constant works out to be in the position function. How are we going to find that constant in our position function? If you want to, you can take a missing parameter approach by reading the problem and identifying the coordinates of a point that the position function has to pass through. You're told that the game hen is thrown upwards from the edge of an 85 meter cliff. What that means is that at the beginning, when t is 0, the position is 85. Don't forget the ground level is 0. So we're going to load 0 in for t and 85 in for s. By the way, negative 9.8 divided by 2 is negative 4.9. I just divided that. Since both of these terms reduce to 0, you're left with 85 is equal to the constant, which means our position function is s equals the negative 4.9t squared plus the 4t plus the 85. And again, I don't think it was necessary to find the constant by looking at an ordered pair that satisfies the equation. What you can do from now on is remember that the constant in a position function would be the initial position. Okay, so now we can proceed to answer the question. We have our acceleration defined, we have our velocity defined, we have our position defined. The very first thing you're asked to find is when the hen reaches its maximum height. Well, when an object reaches its maximum height, it's at that instant in time that the object is no longer moving up or down, which means that it's momentarily, for an instant in time, not moving vertically. And that means our velocity is zero, so we can take our velocity function and solve for t. It's a pretty trivial solution to come up with. We're gonna move the negative 9.8t to the other side, and then we can divide four by the 9.8, which gives us t equals 0 0.408 seconds. The second thing we're asked to find is the maximum height of the hen. Now, we already have a formula for the position, which is height. All we have to do is put into that height formula or that position formula the time that it takes to reach the maximum height. So this time of 0 0.408 seconds is the time that it will be at its maximum height. We just have to find s, which is negative 4.9t squared, 
but T is 0 0.408 plus 4 times T, which is 0 0.408 plus 85, and that will give us our maximum height. I need to take negative 4.9 multiplied by my answer squared and I need to add 4 multiplied by my answer and I need to add 85 and this gives me a maximum height of 85.82 meters. The last thing we are asked to do is to find out how long the hen is in the air. So at what time does the hen reach the ground? Well, that means that S equals zero. The position when it reaches the ground is zero. So if we solve this equation, then what we will be finding is how long the hen is in the air because that time is the time it takes the hen to reach the ground. I doubt very much that this is factorable, no matter how much you play around with it algebraically, so I would use the quadratic formula. T will be equal to negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. So let me calculate B squared minus 4AC. I'm not calculating B squared minus 4AC to see if it's factorable. I'm pretty sure it's not. I just want to know what the number is so I can proceed with my quadratic formula. So I have 4 squared and then minus 4 times A, which is negative 4.9 times C, which is 85, which gives me 1682. So T will be equal to negative B, which would be negative 4, plus or minus root 1682, all divided by 2A, which would be negative 9.8. It's going to give us two solutions here. T will be equal to negative 4 minus root 1682 divided by negative 9.8. T will also be equal to negative 4 plus root 1682 all divided by 9.8. All right, so let's calculate the first solution, which would be negative 4 minus the square root of 1682. And then we have to divide that by negative 9.8. So we get 4.6 seconds. If I calculate the second solution, I'm going to have negative 4 plus the square root of 1682. And I'm going to divide that by negative 9.8. The second solution is negative 3.8 seconds. Of course, we know enough that we're going to kick negative 3.8 seconds over the board because the time in the context of the question can only be positive. So our answer for the third part of this question is that it takes 4.6 seconds for the Cornish game hen to reach the surface of the earth. Your goal in solving these problems is always to start off with basically taking your acceleration that you're either given or you know, using anti-differentiation to find your velocity function and then anti-differentiating the velocity function to find your position function along the way, putting in the initial velocity for the constant in your velocity function and the initial position for the constant in your position function. There are a few questions from your textbook dealing with just initial conditions in terms of missing parameters, where you put in the coordinates of a point that the graph passes through to find the value of the constant. Those questions are on page 411. And then there are a few questions dealing with 
position, velocity, and acceleration, and how they are related to each other through anti-differentiation on page 415, numbers 3 to 5. I hope that made sense, and I hope that you guys have a wonderful rest of the day, and we will talk to you soon. Take care.